السلام عليكم everybody بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين we begin the name of Allah all praise and glory be to Allah and may his finest peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad and his family and his companions and all those who adhere to his guidance asking Allah Azza wa Jal to make us of the best of those who adhere to his guidance اللهم أمين يا رب okay so we continue inshallah our discussion this evening Building on last week, we're discussing what makes the Qur'an miraculous. Last week we spoke about it from a linguistic dimension. How can a work of language, a work of literature, ever objectively be called beyond human reach, be beyond you know, human effort, actually be supernatural? And we covered you know, a, a host of arguments, lines of argument, that could be used to prove that even if you don't firsthand uh, have a, a grasp or a mastery in your grasp of the Arabic language. Today, inshallah, we want to speak about the Quran in I its accuracy in terms of how it speaks about lost human history, aspects of human history that information for it was long forgotten. Because the Quran is remarkably accurate about historical events that would have been absolutely impossible for the Prophet ﷺ to have known. You know some scholars, when they discuss this point, they make an, uh, an interesting assertion. They say the Prophet ﷺ being so accurate, so precise about the lost past, is actually even more impressive than the dozens and dozens of times he spoke precisely and accurately about things to come in the future. Why? Why do you think they said that? That speaking about the lost past accurately and precisely is more remarkable than him speaking about the future accurately and precisely. You think telling the future is like extremely uh, difficult. Why are they saying actually speaking about the past is even more difficult? Anybody want to try? Sheikh Nabil. It happened already, so you can't, uh, what's the word? Reverse engineer it. You can't back project. You know, if I were to say that in the future, there's going to be a masjid on Tillman, with blue carpets, someone can work to bring about that prophecy. They'll buy a property on Tillman to put in it blue carpets to say, Muhammad is a prophet and we have to kill him. <laughs> Not kill him, report him <laughs> to the psychiatric ward. But the past, it's over and done with. You either got it right or you didn't. That's why it's a bigger gamble, they mean, right? It's more risky because you can't change it. And so we want to speak about just some examples of why it's so remarkable. And we'll begin with some examples from ancient Egypt. Because ancient Egypt is widely regarded as a truly lost civilization until very recent history. So the first and most obvious assertion that the Quran speaks about with regards to ancient Egypt in the time of Musa alayhi salam, Allah Azza wa Jal said that Moses went to a pharaoh, the pharaoh rebelled against Allah and against his messenger Moses alayhi salam and they chased after them, the seas parted, pharaoh drowned. That part of the story is already aligned with the Bible, so the Quran didn't say anything new, okay? But this here is different. Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَالْيَوْمَ نُنَجِّيكَ بِبَدَنِكَ لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً Today, the day that we've drowned you, Allah declared to him, we will save you in terms of your body. We will preserve your body so that you may be a sign for those who come after you. A sign for those who want to rebel against God uh, after you. And indeed, many among humanity are heedless of our signs. This mummy exists today in the Egyptian Museum of Cairo. And as someone who recently went to the museum said to me, it's so sad that Allah Azza wa Jal said to us, the Muslims, in our Quran, this is a sign for everyone later, and so many people are heedless of Allah's signs. He said, if you see how casual and how jokative people are in that room, right? It is unbefitting of why Allah Azza wa Jal did this. But bringing it back to prophethood and the, the Quran being a miracle. 
Why is Allah Azza wa Jal saying this, the Quran asserting this, that Pharaoh's body has been preserved for future generations? Why is that remarkable? Number one, you need to know that the preservation of mummies in general is quite uncommon. Most mummies are gone forever. Most of them aren't, don't get preserved. Okay? That's the first thing. So he said that a mummy would be preserved. That's already uncommon. Number two, he said which specific mummy? The mummy of Musa, right? The Pharaoh of Moses, alayhi salam. All the way, he's speaking about a civilization across the globe, if you will. All the way in Egypt, right? That's what he's talking about in, his, in the ayah he's bringing the world. The Prophet Muhammad is speaking about a very specific mummy in a very specific place from thousands of years ago. Also, you, you should keep in mind, it helps to remember that the Qur'an also spoke about many perished nations, many nations destroyed by Allah Azza wa Jal, and Allah never said we preserve this body or that body. Right? So it wasn't a blanket statement because Allah punished these people, He preserves their body. He said Allah punished many people, but this body in particular uh, has been preserved. Also, as we already said, the Bible didn't say this. The Bible did not say that the mummy or the body of uh, Fir'aun will be uh, rescued or saved or brought back, recovered. And so this is an example. I'm going to show you different examples. This is an example of adding a truth that the Bible did not. Okay? The Bible didn't know this even. So you can't even say he got this one from plagiarizing from the Bible. Right? Alayhi salatu was salam. This was civilization long gone. No one knew of them. No one spoke of them, including in biblical tradition. When did people start discovering this stuff? The Rosetta Stone. Anyone know what the Rosetta Stone is? It's in the, in the museum in London, British Museum. Anyone know what the Rosetta Stone is? They just brought it to the British Museum a few decades ago to celebrate 200 years of the birth of Egyptology. What's Egyptology? It is the study of ancient Egypt. That science only started 200 years ago. Why did it only start 200 years ago? Because we had no way to study ancient Egypt before 200 years ago. You see, when, when Napoleon uh, Bonaparte, who some people think was Muslim, uh, when he invaded Muslim lands, right? during sort of this, these invasions of what was discovered is this stone. This was a tablet, a stone called the Rosetta Stone. It was discovered in 1799. These are objective facts. You look them up yourself, right? This was a stone of hieroglyphics and it was finally decoded and so people for the first time were able to decipher, meaning decode, translate ancient Egyptian language. They just started learning about what these people were about, who they were, what they did, and all of that. Before that, it was all lost. All of it. Okay? Just keep that in mind. Knowledge of ancient Egypt was lost for 1,200 years after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And for hundreds of years before him, if we're talking about the Bible, right? And thousands of years before him, if we're talking about Egypt itself. Locked away in the vaults, under the pyramids, in these places. Even if you got in, you didn't understand what was going on. No one knew the language. It was a lost civilization. So now let me give you some examples of what he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, spoke of besides the preservation of the body of Pharaoh. <clears throat> and we'll come back to the Rosetta Stone in a second. So the life of the Pharaohs. If you look at the Bible... When it speaks about the king in the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam, it calls him a pharaoh. Okay? When you look at the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, Joseph, the king in his story is called the pharaoh. And you go to the story of Musa alayhi salam, the king is called a what? A pharaoh. The Quran now refuses to call the king of the time of Abraham anything but the king. King, Nimrud, the Jabbar, that's it. In the time of Yusuf alayhi salam, refuses to call him a pharaoh. He's always called the king, not the pharaoh. The, the Quran knows the term pharaoh. Say, oh, maybe they didn't know. No, the Quran used the terms pharaoh more than 60 times. But they were all only in the story of Musa alayhi salam. So what? 
What does that mean? Now, in the past 200 years, with the study of ancient Egyptian civilization, you go look this up, in Encyclopedia Britannica and elsewhere. This term pharaoh, which meant like elite bloodline or half man, half god, elite house, this was used only under what they call the New Kingdom. The New Kingdom is basically like 13 to 1500 years before the Common Era. So that's how long? About 3000 years ago, okay? And they say that the time of Yusuf alayhi salam was hundreds of years before that, about 17 to 800 years before the Common Era, okay? Further back. And the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam was even further back, about 1850 to 2000 BC, before the Common Era. So in that case, it would be historically incorrect to call the king of Abraham Pharaoh, because the term wasn't around yet. Got it? And it would have been wrong to call it in the time of Yusuf alayhi salam, not just, this is really interesting, not just because the term wasn't around yet, it came in the time of around Moses, right? The time of Thutmose III, about, you know, 10 to 12 centuries before Common Era. But they said also in the time of Joseph, the occupiers of Egypt, the rulers of Egypt were occupiers. They were not actually from the Egyptian bloodline. They were Palestinians. They were called the Hyksos. The Hyksos dynasty, Hyksos, after you decipher the hieroglyphics now, oh, Hyksos meant foreign kings. That's literally what it meant. They were not indigenous rulers. And so even if the term Pharaoh had existed, or even if we're going to say, oh, the Bible was using it loosely, generally, back, they still wouldn't qualify because they were not rulers of Egypt. They were invading forces, occupiers of Egypt for that period. Is that clear? And so now we're not talking about the Qur'an adding a detail about ancient Egypt that the Bible doesn't have. This is a, the Qur'an walking through a minefield of historical inaccuracies in the Bible and never stepping on any of them, right? The Qur'an omitting those historical errors you have in the biblical tradition. How did he do that, sallallahu alayhi wasallam? That's another example. And that is why, before I read to you this, so this is a, the translation, this is like the translation of the book of Dr. Maurice Bukai. So when, when the, the French sent their scientists to research the Rosetta Stone and the excavations and all of that in Egypt, he was among the, the team of researchers that uh, went. And he came back and he wrote this book in French. But this is the translation. The Mummies of the Pharaohs, Modern Medical Investigations. And he won like a whole bunch of national, uh, uh, multiple national awards for this. By the way, many people that are familiar with this discussion claim that Dr. Maurice Bukai became Muslim. I could not find any evidence for him becoming Muslim except maybe the, the wishful, hopeful thinking of Muslims. And we hope he became Muslim. That would be good for him. But if he didn't become Muslim, it is a little bit better for us. <laughs> Meaning it does add credibility that's a sort of non-religious, co-religionist. He's not a fellow Muslim just vouching for his religion. This, this is an objective French government sent forensic researcher who came back and said, this quote, by the way, is not in that book. It's in other writings called uh, Moses and Pharaoh, the Hebrews of Egypt. Uh, this is a translation of what he wrote in French. He said, I must confess that when the Quran was first being conveyed to people, the ancient Egyptian language had vanished from the collective memory of humanity for over 200 years and remained that way until the 19th century. Like, I have no idea where the Quran got this stuff from. He says, therefore, it was impossible for us to know that the king of Egypt should be called anything other than the title mentioned in the Holy Bible. The subtle word choice of the Quran on this matter is thought-provoking. All right? So now, was the Quran <laughs> remarkable in its history after these archaeological excavations? No. The history of the Qur'an was remarkable to the people, its first audience that were hearing it from the lips of the Prophet ﷺ to begin with. In other words, this is fun and everything, but this is overkill. You get it? We, this is even unnecessary.
I'm sorry if the, the image bothers. I know it's an iconic image of sort of the Christian tradition, but uh, it doesn't mean we should feel alienated uh, from it or by it. So you have to keep in mind, so th what's this ayah saying? This ayah is saying that the Prophet ﷺ should tell the people that are disbelieving in his message that the Quran is from Allah. لَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ مَا تَلَوْتُهُ عَلَيْكُمْ Say to them, O Muhammad, wake them up. Tell them if Allah had willed, I would never have recited this to you. Meaning I would never be able to bring this Quran to you on my own. This is like confidential information. Revealed. Secrets are revealed. Right? It's a revelation uh, from a secret source. Right? From Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, nor would he have made it known to you. You wouldn't have had the slightest realization about it. You wouldn't have come anywhere close to this stuff. He says, this is the point of reference. فَلَقَدْ لَبِثْتُ فِيكُمْ umura. For I had remained among you for a lifetime before it. Will you not reason? How's that related? I've lived with you for a lifetime. What does that have to do with this subject? That the Quran is special. If I would have gotten it from another human being, you would have known. You know me. I am the shepherd in the, on the hills and in the valleys of Mecca. I am the tradesman who did trade under my uncle and then shortly for Khadija radiallahu anha. You know everything about me. My life's an open book. I've lived with you for a lifetime. You get it? And, and that is why, you know, the, the, the Jews and Christians among them were those, so many of them were so astonished by this. Like the fact that someone on the hills of Mecca this is the idea, right? Who spent his lifetime in an illiterate society could even know who Abraham is, right? Even know the lineages, even know who Joseph is, Yusuf alayhi salam, right? He brings you the whole surah of Surah Yusuf. Uh, the surah begins with saying, you were completely unaware of this before we revealed it to you. It was a challenge. Do you know who Joseph is? And he gives them the entire account with more detail than they had. To even know who Musa alayhi salam was, to even know who Isa alayhi salam was, to, to even know who Dhul Qarnayn was, besides the simple name. And sometimes it was just one word that was enough for them. You know when the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam was coming back from a ta'if, this is a great example, and you know he was uh, beaten up and he was so exhausted and he was so depressed from the reaction of his people. And then he stopped at that garden. Someone brought him some grapes. His name was Addas, a servant who, who worked on the plantation, on the land. And then before he put the grape in his mouth, he said, Bismillah. He said, hey, where'd you get that word from? What's this Bismillah stuff? He said, uh, I'm mentioning the name of my Lord. He said, that's the statement of my people from Ethiopia. He said, yes, that is the land of my brother, Yunus ibn Matta, Prophet Jonah. He said, you know Yunus ibn Matta? How can you even know who that is? Right? He said, that is my brother. He was a prophet and I am a prophet. And so he believed in him right away. Like, how do you know about Jonah? So to, to think, you know, that the very identities, the very personalities that he knew across cultures, alayhi salatu wasalam, that degree of detail for them was inexplicable. How do you explain that? And we just went through the study of Surah Al-Kahf. Surah Al-Kahf, for those that were not here, was a challenge to the Prophet Muhammad. You know about the seven sleepers in the cave? You know about the righteous king that roamed the earth? So he mentioned that, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ نَبَأَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ We will tell you in full truth their accounts. And not only does he tell them of the accounts, then he goes on, sallallahu alayhi wa to say, and you guys debate, was it three and the dog was four? Was it five and the dog? The surah is talking about the debates your scholars are having about it behind closed doors. And then you guys debate it. Should we build a mosque over the cave or should we leave it as such? And he's telling you the facts of the story and which facts of the story are disputed by you, by your experts. And that is why many of the Jews in the time of the Prophet ﷺ said, he must be a prophet. Whether we believe in him or not is another story. We can explain it away. Prophet to the Arabs, not to us. But he has to be a prophet. We got to stop saying he's not a prophet. It just, it, it is silly at this point. Because of the, the simplest of truths, and he knew so many of them, alayhi salatu wasalam. You even know, I'll give you one last example. In Surah Al Muddathir, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَا جَعَلْنَا أَصْحَابَ النَّارِ إِلَّا مَلَائِكَةً وَمَا جَعَلْنَا عِدَّتَهُمْ إِلَّا فِتَةً لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Over the fire are 19 angels. 
and we did not make it as such as 19 angels except as a trial for the disbeliever. Oh, 19, we can handle 19. 19 is not that much, right? Like as a trial for the disbeliever. Allah then says, the ayah continues, And so the people of the scripture before you can become certain. Like, hey, how did he know it was 19? Because their book said 19. Only the elite of the elite of the experts knew that it was 19, that detail about the day of judgment. So they became certain through the number 19. 19 angels over the fire because it concurred with their records, their scriptures. So they said, how else could he know this? You know, some people, when they try to critique the Quran and say that the Prophet ﷺ was spoon-fed from other people, we say, but then who? Who? They say, oh, but you guys have that story about Bahira. You guys know the story of Bahira? Who's Bahira? Bahira is a monk who was worshipping in a monastery and one time when the Prophet ﷺ was in his youth Abu Talib took him on trade route to Asham and Bahira runs out and says هذا خاتم النبيين هذا سيد الأولين والآخرين هذا رسول رب العالمين He begins to just so this is him sealed the prophets the best of the first and the last this is the messenger of the Lord of the worlds and so how do you respond to this? He had access to these people what would be the response? Think with me, folks. First of all, the account of Bahira is not authentically traceable. Like, yes, we mention it, and there, maybe there's not much harm in mentioning it, but it's not an authentic hadith. It's just mentioned in the history books. And it's also problematic, because if the story of Bahira were true, wouldn't people say that years later when he actually became a prophet? Say, oh yeah, the guy said he was, and right? Uh, they would have cited that. But no one ever made a mention of it again. So that that's already something that problematizes the incident of Bahira. But let us assume it happened. You, you're, you're quoting my books that he met Bahira. It says he met Bahira for an hour. What are you going to get in an hour? And that's what the intended meaning of this ayah is. I've lived with you for a lifetime, meaning it would take a lifetime of apprenticeship that I would not be able to hide to know all that I know. Make sense now? This is the meaning of this ayah. Or they can cite, you know, Waraqa ibn Nawfal. That one's authentic. It's like Al-Bukhari. When he, the angel came to him, he went to Waraqa, the cousin of the, uh, Khadija radiallahu anha. What, is it, what does our narration say? Waraqa said to him, yeah, you're... And then he died a few days later, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, or a short time later, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. You're going to agree or disagree? You're only allowed to agree. No, go ahead, bismillah. Right, so many ways to cut this. Fantastic. Jazakallah khairan. Fantastic. Uh, which version did he get it from? <laughs> which book? And you know, actually we can speak on that in light of this ayah as well. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُمْ يَقُولُونَ إِنَّمَا يُعَلِّمُهُ بشر. We certainly know, Allah says, that they're going to say, or they've said, it is only a human being who teaches him. Someone's whispering in his ear. Right? Then Allah says, لِسَانُ الَّذِي يُلْحِدُونَ إِلَيْهِ أَعْجَمِيٌّ وَهَذَا لِسَانٌ عَرَبِيٌّ مُبِينٌ But the tongue of the one they refer to is foreign. Like you're saying, some Judeo-Christian scholar in Latin or Greek or Aramaic is talking to him. Then we move back to last week's subject. How is the Qur'an a linguistic miracle? even if he had someone speaking to him, supposedly, right? How do you speak about only the source while ignoring the end product? You're attributing him to a non-Arab source, fine, but this is an Arabic end product. لِسَانُ الَّذِي يُلْحِدُونَ إِلَيْهِ أَعْجَمِي This is not an Arabic tongue he's plagiarizing from, right? You're saying outside. But this is the idea that this is a very bizarre hypothetical to begin with. That's what the Qur'an, you know, is so amazing at in, in its line of argument. If you go to the most authoritative scholars on the Bible, and you know, I didn't want to make too many slides, and I just uh, grabbed some of them from, from the book here. You know, one of the toughest recent critics of the Qur'an, William Tisdale, who died in the 1920s, he's a critic of the Qur'an. 
but he uh, honestly admits and he says there seems to be no satisfactory proof that an Arabic version of the New Testament existed in Muhammad's time. That's New Testament. There's not much dispute on this. Uh, one of the popes of Alexandria, Pope Tawadros II, he says the first Arabic, listen, the first Arabic translation surfaced towards the end of the 8th century. The end of the 8th century. And more than 100 years after Islam, and it was done by, by Bishop John of Seville in Spain, it was a partial translation that did not include the entire book and was insufficiently circulated. These are their authorities saying this stuff didn't exist. So you're telling me someone whispered to him for a lifetime and no one knew. Or he had a manuscript of the hundreds of thousands of manuscripts in Arabia of all places. He had the right one and he understood that language that no one knew he understood other than Arabic. And then he produced it. You're just really reaching at that point. It becomes preposterous. And this holds true, by the way, for the Old Testament or what the Jews call the Torah. Uh, Sidney Griffith and the most author authoritative academic researchers in this space, they also agree on this fact that no written Arabic text, even whatsoever, of substantial length, whether scripture or poetry, original or translated, he says, can be traced back to the periods before Islam. So there's no proof whatsoever that anyone had access to that in Arabic at all. Even if Muhammad was the only human on the face of the earth, sallallahu alayhi wa who had the only correct copy with all the correct and extra details, you still run into the problem of what? How is it in amazing Arabic? How is the end product so exquisite? I think I've met my goal of keeping this under a half hour. And I'm, I'm very uh, <laughs> happy about that because we took a few extra minutes last week. Any questions on this before we close?